for joining us for this uh, inspiring keynote. Uh, certainly across the entertainment business, disruption is the main theme at the moment, and the way that the internet is disruption, disrupting traditional television channels, t television production, and audiences is clearly going to be a, a, an opportunity and a threat for everybody in this room. And if, if anybody uh, knows about how to do television well and how to do uh, internet well, it's Brian. So. Um, I'd like you to give him a round of applause to welcome him to the stage. And he's going to share his thoughts on awesome. Good morning. I promise not to disrupt the room. Um, some of you might remember me from, let's see, oh, the uh, TV show Head of the Class when I was an actor. That's me with the mullet. Uh, it's been a long time. But some of you might also be familiar with some of the television shows that I've produced and directed and, and films like Nickelodeon's All That and the CW Smallville and One Tree Hill, movies like Varsity Blues and Wild Hogs. But I've spent the last year working on something disruptive and very exciting, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. And it all started with this guy, Fred. Fred was the first YouTuber to have a million subscribers. And when we met four years ago, I think he had about a half a billion views of his comedy videos that were causing a stir for kids on YouTube. Um, and because of my experience in, the, in, the, uh, in producing content for kids and teens, his agents asked uh, for me to have a meeting with him. And my first thought was, is my career over? <laughs> Why am I meeting this kid from, from YouTube? I make films and television. Um, but I went home that night to my own kids and their friends who were always seemingly at my house eating my food. And that's when the light bulb went off. They all knew Fred. They all loved Fred. They all watched his videos. And when I asked them if they would want to see a Fred movie, one of the kids said, tonight? <laughs> and so I decided to make a Fred movie. And I did something that I had never done before in my career, which is I financed the movie myself. Um, and the reason I did that was because I knew it had to be fast. Um, so I guess it was about four months from the time we met till we wrapped the movie, which is extraordinarily fast by development terms. Um, that movie premiered on Nickelodeon later that year and was the number one movie for kids, teens, and tweens I think on all of cable that year, and it's still one of the highest rated movies in the history of Nickelodeon. We ended up making three sequels and a TV series from it. So it was my experience with Fred, in addition to watching the way my own kids consume content, that made me realize there was a real disruption brewing. And I, I like to joke with my friends that are in TV advertising that if you want to reach my two sons, you're going to have to drive to my house, hop over the fence, knock on the door and hope that one of my sons, Miles or Justin, answers. Because that's the only way you're going to reach them. Because they don't watch television anymore. At least the way we used to watch television, right? So it's funny, because now, uh, where our weekends used to be spent watching my kids on this couch with the TV on, with their friends. Now my wife and I laugh because they're on the same couch with their heads buried in their phones with the TV off. And as you can see, they're really great conversationalists. <laughs> right? I'm sure you parents of teens can relate. Um, and of course, it's not just my kids, but it's not just kids in the US. It's kids everywhere. I mean, the fact is for teens, their devices provide a gateway to their community of friends, and more importantly, to consuming the content they love. Um, their community has become global, and because of that, it's had a major impact on the way I do business, um, from what we produce to what we're distributing to how we distribute it. I mean, what used to take me years to develop and eventually get on network television, now is just taking sometimes a few weeks. Um, the whole window has collapsed for us. So let's start where we're kids and teens are, and that's YouTube. So a year ago, I launched Awesomeness Television. In one year, we now have almost 1 million subscribers and 200 million video views. And those are pretty amazing numbers. And what's really interesting is half our views are coming from outside the United States. Um, our audience is truly gr global. 
And the other half of the views come from mobile. Views and comments are coming from mobile. So seeing this reaffirm the reason I decided to make content on YouTube. If you want to reach and engage kids, you need to go where they are, and that's online. And we launched with over 20 shows when we launched our network. And, and people said I was crazy. A lot of people said, well, you should, you know, Brian, launch with three or four shows, especially the people at YouTube, and see what sticks. And it just didn't make sense to me, and I'll tell you why. Me, you, us adults, we like to eat meals, right? But kids, they snack, and they snack a lot. So, in other words, where I might have a few marquee shows on my radar, kids, because they are on their devices all day and night, have both the time and the appetite to consume a lot of content. And especially around the things they're passionate about. So you gotta deliver what they want, when they want it, and constantly refresh it so they keep coming back for more. So our goal has been to make shows around the topics teens care about and, and they can't find anywhere else, and then deliver it in one socially charged network where they could be part of an authentic community and really see what they want to see and hear what they want to see, hear and share what's cool or funny. So that's why I never looked at Awesomeness TV as just a distribution hub for teen content, but rather really a social network. And it's amazing because we're seeing kids sharing videos and comments, but more than that, we're seeing them create and curate content. Um, in fact, one of the stats that I'm most proud of about Awesomeness is of all the entertainment channels on YouTube, we have the highest engagement for kids and teens. And by engagement, I mean comments, likes, favorites, but most importantly, shares. And seeing this made me realize that we're sort of in this new era of entertainment where the lines between consuming content and participating in it are blurring. So that's why we decided to start our own multi-channel network. So we started the Awesomeness TV network so that kids could be the YouTube stars of tomorrow. And it's interesting because in nine months, we now have 25 million subscribers on our network and almost two billion video views. And most importantly, 65 million monthly unique visitors. So of, of the 80,000 channels in our network, 40% of them are outside of the United States. And kids, they really don't care where the content's coming from, just as long as it speaks to them. So he here's an example. We have a show called Randomness um, that we do on Awesomeness almost every day of the week. And, and it's sketch comedy, funny videos, um, sort of zeitgeisty things. And we knew that the day the, the iPhone 5 came out that everybody was going to be talking about it. Every kid was going to be talking about it. So we wanted to be part of that conversation. So we dressed up one of our actors as an Apple employee. We gave him a box that looked like it was full of iPhones, except it was full of broken glass. And he went past the lines of kids who were queuing up for the new iPhone and dropped the boxes of glass in front of them. And we got crazy funny reactions. We immediately cut that together and put it on YouTube. Within two days, that video had five million views. And here's, here's the key point. You don't get five million views unless people are sharing it. So the bottom line is that creating videos that are funny, shareable, culturally relevant is the best way to engage this audience. Um, and now building on the momentum of music on YouTube and taking what we did with show, um, on shows like One Tree Hill, we have a new show called Side Effects that sort of blends musical covers and story together. Um, you can take a look. Do you have that video? Dad, this is like my hundredth call. Where are you? How could you take off on us like that? The bank in 30 days is foreclosing on the house. Keats had to come back from med school. Sam, you have to go to bed. Sucks to be in charge. And Lexi's gone to the dark side of skin cut. And Jason is a ticking time bomb. It was a few weeks after mom's funeral. We're not okay without you. Sit down, we're eating. I'm not hungry. Sit down! As for me, things are a little... Odd. Crap. Feeling like I'm on high school, lair, sipping on a warm wine coup, lair. Come give me some of that yum like a lollipop, let me set you free. free, free, free. Dad, 
dad told me he was leaving and I let him go. No wonder we had to medicate you, you freak, you let him leave us? Please, it's time to come home. So that's a show made for YouTube. Um, looks like it could be on TV anywhere, but that's, that's the kind of content we're producing and that's working for us on YouTube. So what we're really building with Awesomeness is a brand, um, a brand which is going to live beyond YouTube. And in fact, here's an example of how we're doing it. We do, like I said, sketch comedy almost every day on Awesomeness. And we bundled that together into a half hour show and delivered it to Nickelodeon this summer. That show premiered July 1st and doubled the ratings in the time period year over year. Um, it's pretty impressive. And it was recently picked up for more episodes. So what's happening online today is very similar to what happened in television 25 years ago. Just as branded cable networks like ESPN, and MTV and Nickelodeon transformed television, a new generation of online channels, channels like Awesomeness, is going to do the same thing. Some of us will come and go, but what's important is to find a niche in a, what is a very micro niche universe and stay with it. It's important to be really focused and targeted. For us, it's kids and teens, and we really, really want to listen to our audience. I mean, it's a, it's a two-way conversation. Um, we know who our viewers are and what they're telling us. And in this new world where the audience has the power to decide what they want to watch, where they want to watch it, how they want to watch it, they have so much choice. And ultimately, it still just comes down to one important thing, which is the same thing that it always came down to, which is you just have to make good content. Because at the end of the day, the content wins. Um, what's different is, with this audience especially, you have to constantly refresh that content because they will not just watch repeats over and over again anymore. Those days are over. So that's easier said than done, of course. And with that, we can take some questions. Very, very inspiring stuff. Um, uh, if you have a question, think of it and put your hand up. I'm going to come to you, you guys in a minute. Um, I'm just going to kick off with a couple. Um, what has surprised you the most um, in, uh, throughout the experience? When you went into this, were there things that you thought would happen that didn't, or things that didn't happen that you thought would? Oh, everything surprises me. Um, I was really shocked at the speed that we were able to scale an audience. Um, remember, we started from zero. YouTube five years ago was much easier to build an audience. Now it's a very, very crowded place, um, and I think what worked for us is that we were in the right demo. We, we really are where kids are. So. You are also in, in the place where a lot of people would like to be, which is in the teen demo. And, 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 and that is a challenge for anybody. How do you stay there? What do you do uh, creatively from a production point of view that allows you to own that group of people or at least have a meaningful conversation with them? Well, it's funny because that's the programming that I've made my whole career. So I don't know what it says about me. Maybe I've never grown up. Or maybe I hang around my kids and their friends too much, or I still listen to hip hop. But um, I, I love that space. And I really believe that in order to be successful in that space, you have to be authentic. You can't fake it. Um, so that's what we try to be. Plus, I'm the oldest guy in the office now. Uh, if you came to my office, you'd see you know, everybody's in their early 20s. And all these, these producers and, and filmmakers are really young. And we're giving people a shot. To, re to make stuff. Um, and what can you do with a production which it might have the same uh, brand values of, of, of television, and it's just the distribution platform's different, but the rules are different, the rules that govern the content and, uh, are different as well. I mean, are you very conscious of the fact that that could give you an edge or perhaps a, a negative uh, opportunity as well as a positive one? Well, I, no, not really. I don't think it's about the rules governing how we make the content. I think that we're making short form content is really important, right? So I don't think we're replacing television, let's be really clear. I, I, I think people are watching more television than ever before, right? But what we're doing is we're filling these, these periods of time that kids have because they have these devices, whether it's you're on the school bus or you're waiting at the dentist or whatever it is. Uh, we live in a world where people are impatient, 
right? And especially like my kids, if they're not entertained every second, they lose their mind. And, and so we're here to help that. <laughs> It's really interesting, this argument about not replacing television at the moment, isn't it? Because we all know that a, a YouTube franchise can develop money in a completely different way. The rev share is different, the speed's different. Uh, certainly the, the benefit for the producer with a direct relationship with that audience is different. So in a way, the business model of making YouTube video is replacing the business model of making television content. It's cheaper, it's quicker, it's probably more lucrative for the producer in many ways. I mean, could you talk a little bit about uh, how you would uh, create the anatomy of a commercial deal for a property you're going to put on your channel with how you develop one for television? Because the risks and the costs must, must balance in a very different way. Well, it's interesting. Obviously, the cost point of what we're doing is less. But as you can see from that show, it, it doesn't look any different. Like, that show's side effects I would have made as a pilot for the CW or ABC family or Nickelodeon and you know, probably spend four or five million dollars to make that hour. I can tell you I did not spend that much. Um, but, but truly what we're doing is using the platform as a development platform too. So we're scaling an audience, we're building a brand, but we do get to try out all of this product and see what, what works. And the cost of failure is not very much on YouTube. You know, when I, I see my old colleague from Nickelodeon there, and when I used to make pilots for Nickelodeon, you know, they would make two pilots and probably sometimes for two slots, right? So if you failed once, you were in trouble and you spent a lot of money to make that one pilot. Now I'm making pilots every day, multiple pilots a day. Um, and that's really fun and ener energizing because you're not operating from, the, the, you know, being afraid to fail. Uh, is, it, is it much more profitable or much less profitable to have a hit on YouTube as, as opposed to having a hit on TV? Well, it's still much more pro profitable having a show like Smallville than it is a viral YouTube video. Absolutely. How, how long do you think that will be before that changes? I mean, do you see that changing? I do see that changing. Um, I think the advertising model is catching up, catching up very slowly, right? Right now, TV is getting this much money. YouTube is getting this much money. Um, but we're starting to see a shift. Uh, for next year, we see a big shift, and I think that shift will continue. And I think eventually... An eyeball is an eyeball is an eyeball, and advertisers will pay that way. Um, I also think we'll create properties online that will become very valuable franchise properties that will travel across all medium. So. And, and how about dealing with people in that market who are becoming creators themselves? Because I imagine if I'm a success on YouTube and I'm a young producer, uh, the incentive for me to monetize out of that environment's probably got to be pretty high. I could be turning over a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year for myself and to cut a deal with a channel or a producer to take a share in, in your development deals, maybe not as attractive as it used to be. My, my goal maybe isn't to get a hit on TV, it's to broadcast myself on the channel. Do you have any creative issues around that? See, that's where I think, at least for our demo, that's not true. I think when you speak to kids, the number one thing they want to be is famous. More than anything. And they don't even know what, famous for what, might not be. <laughs> they just want to be famous. And that's the beauty of, of YouTube, and that's the beauty of what we're doing. There's lots of talented people out there that are sort of getting their shot without any filter to do their thing. And that's, that's what's beautiful about the space. Okay. Um, so uh, is there a question in, from anyone in the audience? If you do have one, put your hand up. Um, there's one down the front right here. If we could have a microphone down the front, please. I can do it. Do we have? Yeah, well, go, go ahead and we'll repeat it so everyone else can. Does the mic come? Or do I just give us the question. So in terms of uh, the ecosystem, uh, as far as Austin, Austin is TV is concerned, when do you see money really start coming in which matches your investment? And uh, how do you see it going forward? By the way, my name is Anil Banbari. Okay, in terms of awesomeness uh, TV, when do you start to see money really coming in which matches your investment and surpasses it. And where do you see it going further from here? Anil Banvari from IndianTelevision.com. Um, well, first of all, I, I think the, the real key to see what's going on in the space, to understand how quickly this is growing, and I, I failed to mention this, and I apologize. Um, nine months into the process, Awesomeness TV was purchased by Jeffrey Katzenberg and DreamWorks Animation. 
Um, sort of paid off then. That should, that should sort of tell you a lot about where the space is headed. Um, because there's a man who really understands media and, and you know, wanted in on this. So I think, I think we're moving quickly towards real monetization. Now there's gonna be winners and losers, right? Not everybody's, everything's gonna work. But there's a handful of companies in Los Angeles right now that are really, I think, going to be, like I said, the next generation of cable networks like ESPN and CNN and MTV and Nickelodeon. Um, they are going to be born out of this. Um, so, When you were approached by, by DreamWorks or the conversation was had, what were the key drivers for that acquisition and uh, what, what was their rationale for, 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 get, for getting in uh, early? Because it was fairly, fairly early. I think Jeffrey really saw what was going on on YouTube and, and wanted to be part of it. And I think what attracted him to awesomeness is our, our demo, right? What we were doing and that we were creating original content. So there's a lot of big networks on YouTube, but they're sort of aggregators. We were actually making stuff and we were bringing an audience and we were scaling at enormous speed. What are you spending on, a, on an average series and how much money will you commit to production this year? <laughs> um, I'd say this year we'll ballpark. ballpark $10 million, not a, not a ton of money, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and it's all over the place. Like something like that is the most money we'll spend on something. And then we'll do a video like that iPhone 5 prank video that got 5 million views and spent $500. So it's all over the place. Yeah. Um, question down the front here, please. I, I, David, I didn't finish the question. Oh, oh sorry. If I so, may. Sorry, I think uh, we'll, we'll just take another one. We've only got seven minutes left. Hello, thank you for a marvelous talk. Um, on mobile devices, are you going to see YouTube as your primary channel, or are you thinking about doing awesomeness TV apps or apps around particular properties? How are you going to deliver stuff to those devices beyond YouTube's app? We're going to live everywhere. I mean, uh, YouTube is just the beginning, so uh, awesomeness will have a mobile app, um, will be available on Xbox and PlayStation and, and any other device that you could tell me exists. We, we want to live everywhere. And we're also very interested in our, and going to aggressively move forward into expanding the channels internationally in other languages. Where will you go next, do you think? What will be your first offshore channel? You had your way. It's interesting. We have a huge audience in Brazil. We also have a big majority of our, our network is in the UK. Um, and we have some, some big you know, UK YouTubers involved with us. So um, it's going to happen quickly next year, and we'll probably go to multiple markets. And how will that affect the mother brand? Because you're saying already 40% of your audience is international. Are you cannibalizing that audience, or are you creating new audiences? No, I think we'll create a new audience. And that's the beauty of YouTube, is that on day one, your content's global. You know, and, and most of the people in this room are used to, like, we make a show in America, then we have to come here and sell it. Our show, our, our stuff's traveling on day one. And, and how does programming come in? I mean, do you take pitches? I mean, for these guys in the room here, are they pitching your shows, or are they, is it coming out of the ether? We don't, we don't really take a lot of pitches. Um, we have a small team, and we're very sort of entrenched in this whole YouTube community. Um, and we like to say we don't, we don't develop anything. We, just have, we don't have development meetings. We have making stuff meetings because we don't have time for development because we have to make so much content. Okay. Um, question there in the middle, uh, gentleman with his hand up. Can you put your hand up again? If you let us know who you are before you ask the question, please. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I'm Jarin from Korea Synergy Media. It's on Animation Studio. And I have a question about the, uh, you mentioned about the aggregator and Awesomeness TV providing a production services and having a demo, the exact demo for the, for the audience. And what would you um, advise the uh, people who are preparing for MCNs, uh, making different, differentiate, differentiating the channel from aggregator to um, MCN? I think the MCN's business is, is an interesting business. I, I don't really look at what, even though we are a multi-channel network, we didn't go about it in the traditional MCN business, meaning most of the MCNs are aggregating out of all different verticals, right? You have beauty and fashion people and comedy people and bloggers. We are strictly one demo. We have 25 million teens. And these are kids that really aren't interested in higher CPMs or us promising anything. All we promised them was the chance to participate. 
and they came in droves. And that's what's really exciting about what we've built. It's interesting that you're taking your properties and developing them now with television channels. Um, what's the reason for that? Is it commercially driven or is it audience driven or is it brand driven? Why do you do that? Well, I think we concentrate on making short form content on YouTube, right? So that show, Side Effects, will be delivered in five, six minute episodes. But that's a show that could easily live in you know, an hour format on television. So we want to play in both worlds. We, we think that there's a great opportunity to start stuff on YouTube, develop it, build an audience, and then drive that audience to our content in other forms somewhere else, like we did with our show on Nickelodeon. And when do you think that um, digitally delivered viewing will stop being a short form experience and start being a long form experience? Does something have to happen in the meantime? Because if I'm connected and I'm, I'm on, it doesn't really matter when I, when I stop watching at 6, 10, 30, 60, does it? Well, Netflix is digitally delivered, right? And that's sure. long form entertainment, but so it's already happening. Form. Yeah, right? so, so why don't you do long form that way? We will. I think, I think YouTube right now is a short form experience. I really do think it is. I think for kids, they love it for that. Their attention, it's where their attention span is. I don't love it as a filmmaker, to be perfectly honest for you, but I love feeding their passion for the content. Any more questions? Question down the front here. It's coming. So has Jeffrey asked you to make a feature film yet? No, he wants me to stay in my lane and stay out of his business. Clearly. I tried to go to the test screening of the last movie. They didn't let me in. I told them I had some notes. What, what ha and, and I'm sorry, Elizabeth Guider, I'm writing for The Hollywood Reporter. I wondered if, um, w what exactly is your goal within the DreamWorks animation family, though? I think what we're doing is giving the studio another platform to sort of um, develop content, reach an audience, and ultimately help them market the movies, right? Um, and, and I think that's part of the reason that Jeffrey was excited about what we're doing. Um, Thanks for that question. It's just sort of wrapping up, we're into the last couple of minutes here, and in terms of the disruptive nature of what you're doing, and you are one of the pioneers in that space in terms of how you're making, distributing, and developing a network to all intents and purposes. If you were running a traditional network now, let's say a Nickelodeon, uh, instead of the business that you're running, um, what would you be doing to uh, shape up to competition like yourselves? First of all, I'd pick up all my shows. <laughs> Immediately. It would be nothing but Brian Robbins shows on Nickelodeon. Um, you know, the one thing that I would do, I don't think they make enough content, right? I mean, if you look at this, the primetime schedule on most of those networks, there's like three, four original shows on. It's not enough. It used to be when there was only two channels, you would watch repeats of my shows, Keenan and Kel, over and over and over again. Now, with, the, with my mobile phone and a tablet, I have so many choices. And I think that's the big problem. I think the model's a little broken. The shows are really expensive to make, which means they could only make a certain amount of them. And they're sort of stuck. And I think until they figure out how to change that model, um, you're going to see the audience keep eroding. And so, last question. A year from now, how will the business be different? And what's standing in the way of you doing what you want to do next? Is the one big thing you want to do in the next 12 months? I mean, really for us, it's to continue to build a brand. Um, we feel like in, in 12 months, we've done a great job of, of building the brand of awesomeness. Um, I would like to think that, you know, another 12 months from now, we could be back here and the brand could even be bigger and, and really be thought of in the likes of the other big entertainment brands for kids and teens. Well, good luck with that. And thanks ever, Thank ever you. so much for joining Thank us today. Thank you very much.